Hello and welcome to another episode of Strategic Talk, where we have an expert to talk about certain issues and what they think of it. So let's move to today's episode. We have Mr. Simon Agnot Nielsen with us, and he's joining us from Norway. He was an Erasmus scholar at the University of Glasgow. Hi, Simon. How are you? I'm doing very well. Thank you for uh, being on the show. Thank you. So uh, today on Strategic Talk, we will be talking about gray zone warfare, a topic that is not commonly heard among the mass. So what the gray zone is actually, if you have to make our audience understand in simpler words. Yeah, uh, sure. So uh, what the gray zone is, is actually quite a, a simple question, but a very, there's a very complex answer to it, like most questions. Um, so because the gray zone is uh, ambiguous, it is uh, quite difficult to, to define in the first place. Uh, so we can say that the gray zone is an operational space between peace and war, involving coerc and coercive uh, actions to change the status quo uh, below a threshold that in most cases would prompt a conventional military response. Um, it often blurs the lines between military and non-military actions, um, and it is difficult to attribute events. Um, so with the uh, definition that I just explained, there are uh, a few things that it tells us about uh, what the gray zone is. So first of all, it is an operational space between peace and war. That's the most basic factor. It involves coercive action, um, but it doesn't have to involve kinetic uh, means. Um, it seeks to change or establish the status quo. Uh, it seeks to avoid escalation. And it seeks to use a mixed uh, basket of methods um, between military and non-military uh, actions, as I mentioned. Um, finally, uh, it seeks to avoid the attribution of events. Um, so there's a lot to um, unpack there in what I just mentioned. Um, and it can involve anything from the construction of artificial islands uh, to use a little green men, to use a reference from uh, Russia and Ukraine from a few years ago. Um, there's also a heated debate of whether gray zone uh, can is, is a characteristic or actually a type of warfare, uh, and it's or if it provides something new to our understanding of war. Uh, this is because warfare, through its traditional understanding, uh, includes extremely violent means uh, of conflict and has strong connotations to the kinetic use of force. Um, so, uh, so there's a there's a, there's a debate about uh, about uh, how we can we can define uh, the gray zone, um, but there are a few a few factors to uh, to consider. Uh, so as you're saying, the countries worldwide are experiencing new kinds of conflict but below the threshold of what is commonly known as war or understood as war. But why are the states choosing gray zone as gray zone aggression over conventional attacks? Mm -hmm. And so the most basic uh, answer to that is that actors uh, avoid the threshold of conventional war um, because they uh, they don't want to escalate uh, tensions through the use of con conventional uh, weapons. By acting in the gray zone, um, states, for instance, can uh, avoid the loss of prestige uh, and conduct clandestine activities, which are more difficult to attribute back to them. Uh, we can take an example, um, if a stronger state attacks a weaker state, um, it can be trapped with the choice of not retaliating or risking a strategic defeat. Uh, a good analogy is the Melian dialogue from the Greek uh, scholar to, to uh, Cydides or Melia. Um, 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 yeah, Melia got the choice to... Uh, to either go with what the stronger party wanted to or just be destroyed. Um, so secondly, if a weaker state a strong, attacks a stronger state, uh, the stronger state is given the choice of non-escalation or to shift its strategy from, uh, from one of the terrorists uh, to one of war. Uh, and as history shows, uh, superior power powers fighting weaker states never necessarily lead to uh, simple victories. Um, so war through conventional methods uh, is always attempted to be avoided because of that. So the most horrifying thing about it is this war never ends. It's, con it's consistent, it's holistic, comprehensive, and uses all the tools it has at its disposal. So even if we can somewhat monitor these activities, are we prepared enough to respond to them yet? 
Well, one can never be prepared enough, especially in today's world when uh, technological developments happen so quickly and the operational methods used by grain zone initiators uh, change incredibly fast. Um, so when seeking out defense strategies, it's important to be aware um, of the possibility of inadvertently escalating tensions by trying to respond to them. Uh, this is because gray zone operations are uh, almost always constant, such as cyber attacks, information oper operations, uh, and, and as you also mentioned. Uh, it is therefore um, important to look for strategies that seek to de-escalate rather than escalate uh, tensions, although that is a difficult thing to do. Uh, it is equally important not to be too eager in placing all belligerent uh, activities into the gray zone. Um, the gray zone then quickly becomes a, a giant lump term and too expansive. And it can also be unfortunate in terms of uh, uh, escalating uh, uh, tensions. So um, going back to if uh, if you are prepared enough, um, probably probably not. And it's it's probably it's probably impossible to be prepared enough anyway. Um, but within preparations, it's important to be kind of uh, level-headed and kind of um, and uh, to think about this. Um, in, um, in, uh, in, in a practical way that's, um, that, that's beneficial for, uh, for dealing with it. This particular warfare technique can use religion, culture, economy, and anything. If any country can employ these tactics, it's a strategy of influence. What could happen if a state fails to take action against gray zone aggression? Mm -hmm. Uh, so a little bit uh, of what I mentioned uh, to uh, to your previous uh, question, to prevent um, a gray zone attack, the defending party must first understand who is behind the attack and what the motives are. So this uh, this needs some quite extensive knowledge of uh, or, or or intelligence. Um, they must understand why they are being targeted in the first place and what sort of interests the attack serves uh, for the party who is initiating the attack. Uh, gray zone attacks are, as I said previously, ambiguous. Uh, so it's usually hard to know who has initiated them. Uh, since they also blur the thresholds of kinetic warfare, the methods of response are usually quite limited. Uh, and as mentioned uh, just before, the responder always runs the risk of inadvertently escalating uh, tensions in the if the response is too strong. Um, the first step is therefore to analyze what type of attack uh, that is taking place and try to link it to, uh, to the, modi, the modus operandi of an actor. Um, this does require quite an extensive knowledge of the modus operandi, which uh, actors uh, or other states usually use. Um, it also requires um, distinctions regarding what type of responses are appropriate in each, in each uh, specific case. Um, finally, responses should not forget that uh, gray zone warfare is nothing new and that they therefore, or most states, they actually most likely have a, a, an extensive experience in dealing with them uh, in the first place. Uh, it is therefore recommended to stay level-headed, as I mentioned uh, before, um, when faced uh, with such attacks. Uh, oftentimes, the purpose of gray zone attacks is to destabilize the receiving end, um, such as the case as uh, with information campaigns. A sporadic and ill uh, thought through response, uh, therefore, uh, will uh, more likely play into the hands of the aggressor. So it is uh, important to uh, re avoid the more uh, reactive responses and, and try to work proactively to, um, to deal with the uh, attack really before it takes place or to deter it from taking place in the first place. Uh, you mentioned several types of attacks being held. So can you please elaborate a little bit on that part? Yeah, so um, there is a, quite a, a massive uh, basket of, uh, of um, operations which can be conducted in the gray zone. Um, basically, it can, it can be anything that's coercive and that seeks to, uh, to, uh, to stay below a, th a certain uh, thres uh, threshold of uh, kinetic force. Um, so two of the more, uh, um, the more commonly used uh, tactics in this space is, um, um, is cy cyber attacks, for example, um, are quite uh, commonly used. Um, and the same with uh, information campaigns and also influence operations, um, where uh, 
and aggressor seeks to uh, to to influence the uh, the uh, receiving end to act in a certain way that they would find uh, beneficial for themselves. But it can also be kind of more uh, uh, discrete means and things that take place over a long, uh, long time. So gray zone uh, uh, attacks are usually quite incremental, um, but they always have some sort of strategic aim in the end. Um, so we have seen that China, for example, uh, constructs artificial islands uh, in the South China Sea. That also can be a way uh, that, or that, that can fall under gray zone uh, uh, attacks. Although the definitional distinctions uh, are a bit blurry to if we can actually consider that as warfare. Um, so that's why it's important to uh, to be quite specific uh, when it comes to the to the responses of what type of attacks should be considered uh, as aggressive and which sort of attacks uh, can kind of um, ha has less of a, a, a strategic effect uh, in the end. So where do you see the future of this? What are our possible threats? Um, so gray zone warfare will only become more prevalent in the future, in my opinion. Um, as long as there are competing interests, uh, there will be new horizons for conflict. Um, the gray zone is a highly convenient space to conduct operations in, and there is no reason to think that it will become less appealing in the future. Um, technological developments and so on, of course, play an important role, uh, especially within cyber and information campaigns. Uh, in addition, there are clear signs that um, the international environment is becoming more conflictuous uh, and international cooperation is to an extent dissipating uh, in favor of uh, unilateralism in many areas. Um, yet few have the interest in resorting uh, to war at the international level. Uh, because of the very damaging uh, costs, both economically um, and, of course, in, in terms of uh, human casualties. Um, so to, uh, to conclude on that question, uh, yes, grazing and warfare uh, will most likely be, be part of our future uh, for, for the good or for the worse. And again, we should put more attention to it, the situation should attract more attention than it is being right now. But I believe we're close to the end of this episode. So thanks a lot for joining us. And we're really overwhelmed having you here. Hope to see you in more. See you more in our next episodes. Till then, take care, everyone. And keep your eyes on our social media handles for more updates. Thank you. Thank you very much.